first um, letter, short letter, uncharacteristically short. When I text someone and I tell them that I'm empty and afraid and would like to know that they still love me and they don't text me back, I get more afraid. Well, of course you do, because all your life you've been neglected and not felt loved. And so you reach out and say, would somebody please love me? And you couldn't know that half the people that you texted didn't get your text or were doing something else and the other half don't have enough love to give. So it has nothing to do with you, but it would feel like it does. Uh, it would confirm uh, a lifetime of being neglected, which is no better than being outright abused. And yet taking this risk is the only way to find what you want. It's the scariest thing people do. They, I was talking to a lady earlier today uh, about a relationship and she just, she hangs on to a horrible relationship because she sees it as a form of safety, which is a complete illusion. Just like you're not reaching out to people seems safe, not in order to get onto the big boat, you have to get out of the leaky lifeboat. But that's a scary moment. Uh, if the leaky lifeboat is all you had and somebody comes along and says, jump out of the lifeboat and we'll throw you a rope. You're thinking, no, because jumping out of the leaky lifeboat would seem life-threatening when it's really life-saving. So keep Keep sending up the text, kid. Um, you might need to refine your list. Uh, you might need to talk to some wise people who will suggest to you people who are generally more available, or sometimes you may have to simply wait longer. Um, many times people have said to me, nobody responded to my text, and I learned that nobody responded to their text within 33 seconds. People are doing other stuff, so keep at it. Just don't quit. Next uh, writer says, a co-worker told me that he would call me and let me know <clears throat> about the um, ceremonial drumming on Friday. And he would pick me up and we could participate in the event. For those of you who don't know what ceremonial drumming is, um, people get together and they bring drums of every imaginable description, everything from a great big kettle drum uh, to little itty bitty, you wouldn't believe how small drums, and they drum. It sounds a little weird, but I've seen it. Uh, and people get kind of a, I don't know, a harmony. Uh, and some people get a sense of connection uh, from it. I'm sure not making fun of it. Uh, it, it. It really seems better than nothing to some people. And if that enables them to connect to people to the point where they can then begin to like actually speak to people, cool. Uh, but I've also known people who've been ceremonially drumming for 20 years and managed to make no connection at all. So it's not the drumming, um, it's the being together with people. Anyway, that was a parenthetical, unnecessarily long probably explanation of the drumming. Um, then you continue. Uh, he didn't call. He, so he said he was going to call about the ceremonial drumming, that he was going to pick you up, everything. So you got your expectations all up. I mean, you've got the, the night that it's going to happen. He's going to come get you. <clears throat> Nothing. Doesn't even call. When I get to work, he says, oh, I lost your phone number, but now I found it. Mm, how many times have we all heard stuff like that? Um, oh, I, I forgot. Um, people don't forget their birthday. Um, oh, I lost your phone number. Yeah, possible. And yet rarely do people lose their health insurance card, um, you know, or their AAA number. Um, so possible, yeah. But in my experience, people lose what they don't value. Sure, there are some people who lose everything. Yes, I got it. But frankly, those people don't tend to not value anything. Um, we lose what we don't care about, with rare exceptions. They're just plain accidents. Um, 
especially when he says he lost it and then suddenly, oh, I found it after the event. Mm. So you don't really know that he's lying, but you know, it's kind of one piece of information. It's just one piece of information, kind of like one point on a map doesn't mean very much. But with multiple points, you begin to establish a direction, uh, or in your case, with this guy, pattern. You, you continue. He said he would call me the next Friday. Sensible. Uh, since there are three more occasions that the drumming takes place. He didn't call again. I asked if he'd gone to the ceremony, and he said he didn't. See, now we're way past the point of believability. Uh, two weeks in a row, uh, he said he'd show up, and he didn't. Um, you you got to ask yourself, why would somebody tell you they'd do something and then not do it? Because there are people who who live for the easiest way. Actually, that's true of most people. And so a great number of people will tell you straight to your face what you want to hear just to get your smile for two seconds, even if it causes them emotional conflict and causes you inconvenience for, oh, they don't care, days. They live for eliminating the pain of right now. And, and actually, they don't even eliminate the pain of right now. They just elim they have the illusion of safety. They stay in the leaky lifeboat in the middle of the ocean. So he didn't call. He told me that, oh, you didn't miss out on anything since there wasn't drumming that week. They would be put off for a month, and then we could go. So this is the story. The person obviously is lying to me, and I'm somehow allowing it by buying into his stories. I'd like to go to listen to the drumming, and every Friday I was waiting for his call. A part of me knew that he would not call. Uh, another part was waiting. So what can I do to stop this cycle? Tell him that I'm no longer interested? It, it's not about what to do about the drumming. It's about how to interpret inf information. He's, is he lying? Mm, we don't know for sure. But is he reliable? <laughs> no. I, mean, I wouldn't believe this guy if he told me it was noon, looking at his watch. So, you know he's not reliable. Well, that's all you need to know. But you know that you can't count on him. Um, then you decide whether you really want to go drumming. <clears throat> not go drumming with this guy. Forget that. He, he's not going to show up to anything. He might not show up at his funeral. So, do you want to go to the event? If you do, you find out through somebody else uh, who knows the details. I mean, surely he mentioned to you where it was going to be and so on. Somebody at that location knows about the drumming. Uh, count on it. These these things are always held either at somebody's house, at a church, at a something. Somebody will know about it. And then go with somebody else or go by yourself. You just don't count on unreliable people. You've obviously been deceived so many times in your life by people who have, for example, said with their lips, I love you. I care about you. Your parents, teachers, friends, whoever. And then their behavior says, no, I don't. I don't really care about you. And you hang on to the words. That's really the lesson here. That's it. It's not this guy. It's not drumming. Pay attention to what people do, not to what they say. Or you're going to be confused forever. And you'll get tricked by everybody. The truth's almost always in the behavior. Gee, I really, really meant to be on time, and yet this person's late to everything. Oh, they didn't mean to be on time. They just want to look like they meant to be on time. Next letter um, is from somebody who says, our groups tend to have, our real love groups, tend to have a lot of folks who want to jump in and offer fixes for people. Several of them have not read the book for wise men and women, and it seems to be getting worse. People are cutting each other off in a gold rush to come up with yet another suggestion. So people are not being seen or understood, and the love in the room takes a dive. Here's an example. In a real love group, a person was sharing about a real estate deal that she was involved in that brought up a number of feelings in her. In the group, there were a couple of folks in real estate who 
jumped in to offer advice on how to deal with the real estate issues and blah, blah, blah. Here's what you should do. And after the third or fourth contribution, the person who is sharing, this is unbelievably wise on the part of the person who is speaking, told the people that she didn't come to the real love group. There's a certain symmetry here that I enjoy. She didn't come to the real love group for real estate advice. She came to be seen and loved. <clears throat> That's pretty smart. It was never about the real estate issues. <clears throat> Bless her heart. So what do you do as a member of the group? You really have to speak up if this keeps happening. I mean, if somebody does this once in a while, mm, that's how they learn. But people come to these groups, in most cases, for the first unconditionally loving experience of their entire lives. This is it. What a pity it would be to waste that. So you can say consistently at the beginning of a group, until you've read the Real Love for Wise Men and Women book, oh, and that's not enough. Having an intellectual understanding is just the beginning. And until you've listened to people be genuinely wise and loving, I strongly recommend that you read the book and listen. Practice listening first before you open your mouth. People are here to be listened to, not to be advised. So we're here to love first, to teach second, and a distant hundred is to offer our opinion. Then you say this, and if you repeatedly fix, if you interrupt to offer advice, I will point it out. Somebody in the group has to have the guts to do that. Uh, I don't care what you call them, whether you call them the host or the king, doesn't matter. But repeated fixing cheats people of feeling love. That's the problem. So what do you do? So every week you do what I just suggested at the beginning uh, until the fixing problem goes away. <laughs> but people will still fix. Um, you'll speak and they won't hear a word. You're, fixers don't listen. So even as I'm speaking to fixers, I realize they're not hearing me. So they're still going to fix. So what do you say when they still fix? I'm going to propose a couple of things. So to the speaker, to the person who's speaking, who's being fixed, you can say this. Right while the fixer is talking, you can say, right now, do you feel like you're being fixed, like you're a problem being solved, or do you feel understood and supported? Now, see, in the case of this real estate person, she would have said, no, I feel like I'm being fixed. In which case, then you just move right into being the wise person. You don't need to stop the fixer. Rarely do you need to correct the fixer. You just step in and be loving. Now, what do you say to the ineffective wise person? Usually you don't have to say anything. Usually you just be a wise man and be an example. But some people cannot stop themselves. I can think of several examples off the top of my head. They don't get the hint. There's no such thing as hinting with these people. So you hold up your hand in the relatively universally recognized symbol of stop gently. You, you don't need to like say hit them with your hand. Um, just hold up your hand and you tell the wise man, you say right now, like I talked about at the beginning of group, you're fixing. I'm just telling you that for your information. You don't have to tell them to stop. You just say, you're fixing. Now, they might be irritated. Uh, in fact, that's pretty common. In which case, they're actually proving that they were fixing, that they were not loving the speaker. Pe people who did not intend to fix, and you point out that they're fixing, are grateful to learn. But really dedicated fixers, now they're going to fight you. Then you show them the potential uh, of what could happen. You teach them, show them what it looks like. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, we have we do this every week, but I'm just gonna give you a couple since this is coming up. So um, let's say somebody 
you ask the, the speaker how they feel about the problem that they're describing. Like the real estate person, it's always about the feeling. And she even said that, which is amazingly brilliant. Um, and they'll say things like, well, I feel inadequate, um, stupid, foolish, frustrated, unworthy, whatever. Listen. So if somebody says, well, I feel stupid, as a wise person, you'd say, well, then you probably are stupid. Uh, we're all stupid. Um, I'm stupider today than next year. Actually, I hope that I'm stupider today than the next year because I actually want to learn something. And this is hard, what you're describing. This particular decision, it's not about the real estate. It's about your feeling worthwhile. I get that. Now, listen to this. I get the feeling you're describing. And because of that, because I get it, you're now not alone. See what I did just there? I really listened to the person, to their feelings, and then proposed a solution to the feeling not a solution to the real estate problem. I get you, so you're not alone. That changes everything. It changes the way you feel as you deal with this problem. If you feel safe and not alone, then you will figure out a solution much better than otherwise. I can't even count how many times I've just told people, I understand your pain. And they know that I do, I'm not pretending. And then within 60 seconds, they propose a solution to a problem that they had never seen before because they're not afraid. That's all I helped them do. People sometimes even say, wow, you really understand whatever, real estate, mathematics. In one guy's case, I remember um, cattle breeding. <laughs> I don't know anything about cattle breeding. But I listened to him, and as he became unafraid, he came up with a solution to his cattle breeding ranch or whatever they call cattle breeding operations um, problem because he wasn't afraid. Very cool. I helped him do that just by understanding him and loving him. Uh, that's, that's just one example. Um, I think I'll skip the second one. Listen, listen, listen. Understand. Love them. And then maybe teach them something. But offer advice sometimes, but not often. And if you want to know how often, read the book, Real Love for Wise Men and Women. Um, time for Sylvie. <clears throat> A Sylvie story. Uh, Jeanette says, the first thing Sylvie said to me one morning was, if parents are angry to their kids, then Jesus wants them to stop it. <laughs> Now, this is an example, not about Jesus. It's an example about self-confidence. This kid knows what is right or wrong, not just what her parents tell her they want. And it's a big difference. Most kids are raised in absolute chaos. There is no absolute right or wrong. Right or wrong is determined by the mood of their parents which is just awful. So most people never figure out who they really are. I run into that every day with people 30, 40, 70 years old. This little kid is, how old is she now? Four. See, they keep changing their ages. It's quite inconsiderate. And at four, she knows who she is. So that if her mother, who for most kids is the center of the world, is having a bad day, that doesn't make her a bad person. No, she'll actually say to her mother, so is that loving of you, mommy, or would you like to say that in a different way? <laughs> that one just cracks me up. It really brings a parent to a stop. She knows who she is. She knows right and wrong. She knows loving and not on her own. Now, her mother taught her, bless her mother, that her mother had the guts to teach the kid absolute principles instead of just follow the dictator which is a, not a very useful life lesson unless you want to, you know, learn, grow up and learn how to run concentration camps. Um, this reader, writer, participant, member says, I'm often surprised at how much kids' television focuses on characters falling in love. 
It's in almost all the big Disney films, for example. Like, take the biggest kids' film of last year, Frozen. Are there really no other topics to entertain a seven-year-old? Nothing sells like sex, falling in love, which universally, almost universally, implies sex, and violence. Because these things just fill the senses. If you've got no sense of what unconditional love is, then what do you do? Then you feel your physical senses. And boy, falling in love and violence and sex, that'll do it. Um, it's exciting. And it's also unbelievably dangerous. I look at two 14-year-old kids who are dating and just want to close my eyes and pretend it's not happening because they're going to get into trouble. I look at kids' TV programs, cartoons even, and it shows kids who are falling in love and kissing. This didn't happen when I was a kid. Kids who are kissing who are obviously nine, eight. Well, every kid who experiences the excitement of kissing wonders what's what's the next excitement because that wears off. And before long, they're in a forest fire that they have no idea how to control. You continue. Both of my children often talk about being in love, um, teasing each other about being in love with someone in their class, or talking about classmates or friends being in love with someone or another. Baby, it, it's the pot of gold falling in love. It's the great promise of unspeakable and mysterious happiness. Um, it's the lost ark. It's winning the lottery. The bottom line is it's magic. And everybody wants a magical solution. Hence the lottery. This is the emotional lottery, falling in love. Falling. I mean, the very term is beautifully self-descriptive. We fall in love like you fall in a ditch. Um, and yet the seduction is just almost irresistible. If you got nothing going on in your life, well, man, I'll, yeah, I'll take a little falling in love. Even if then it, the relationship becomes stagnant, abusive, self-destructive, now that falling in love will keep you going for a long time because you keep trying to regain it. Um, you say initially it was um, amusing, uh, harmless fun, but now I'm thinking it might be important to talk to them about it. Actually, we tried once, probably not very well, but they didn't really seem to take it on board at this age. Uh, and, you know, I think she actually told me the ages of her kids, but now I can't remember. But I got the idea it was like eight and ten or something. Um, let's see. At this age, is it enough to keep talking to them about unconditional love, explaining what it is, and hope that they get that falling in love uh, that they see in films is not the real thing? No. Uh, it's not enough to just hope. You don't ever hope a kid gets an important principle. Good luck. Uh, it'd be like a math teacher standing up in front of the class and singing Kumbaya and hope that they understand trigonometry. Uh, probably not. Just because they're in the class? No. So first, you teach them about real love, mostly by living it. If you're teaching them with words and you ain't living it, they're not going to listen to you. And frankly, why should they? Then teach them about imitation love. Every time you see it. So you said, we tried explaining it once and it didn't go over very well. Oh, well, you, baby, you just warming up. Uh, they need to hear it hundreds of times. Ask my kids. When we would watch movies together, this is way back when I'm just first learning. Uh, about real love. And as we're watching a movie and we get to a scene that depicts whatever, uh, falling in love, implied sex, uh, whatever principle, boom, um, magically the controller appeared in my hands. Actually, it was I, they're, they're pretty sure an extension of my hand. Um, and I would pause the movie and then go, okay, what are we learning here? And yeah, the first, oh, probably 100 times, uh, really, they groan and go, oh, Dad, not another lesson. But after a while, 
they, they get the lesson. And if you're teaching them a principle that they're seeing on a TV or a movie screen, it turns out that it actually makes it way easier when you're teaching it from in their own lives. So I loved watching movie with the, movies with the kids. Um, they would say, in the beginning, you have to teach the lesson. But eventually they'll say, well, I mean, these two are falling in love, but these two have no clue what's coming next. Anybody can smile. Anybody can kiss you and enjoy it. Uh, anybody can have sex. Dogs do that. Um, but actually have an unconditionally loving relationship? These people are clueless. And they're trying to skip the step of unconditional loving and hope that sex or falling in love is going to make a relationship. And it doesn't. And until the kids can teach you that lesson without groaning or frowning or being sarcastic, then you keep pausing the movie or the television show or whatever. It's pretty powerful stuff. So I encourage you to watch this stuff with your kids, even the falling in love stuff, the stuff that's just poop. Do it. Because uh, you're finishing the scene for them as it plays out in real life. It's usually disappointment and misery. So use it. Don't regret what Disney does or Hollywood does. Use it to your advantage. Um, I was talking recently to, to a woman who uh, was absolutely overwhelmed by life. Everything. Everything in her life was going badly. I spent some time with her, taught her a little bit about what it was like to feel loved. She experienced a huge shift in her life. She said she wanted to be happy. I said, mm, if you really want to be happy, you'll be willing to sacrifice anything to get it. Are you willing to do that? Oh, yeah, she said. <laughs> Again, you don't listen to the words. You listen, you listen to the behavior. So I made some recommendations. Um, lose your present boyfriend. Um, quit your job. Um, something else. She did none of those things. So she went through another year of living hell and came to me again and said, I really want to be happy. Okay, so are you willing to do anything? Well, she'd already lost the boyfriend. And so I said, your job, your job appears to be killing you. It's not my guess. Every time you talk about it, your face just is anguished. And she said, yeah, I hate my job. I just feel like it's just crushing me. Do you have enough money to live on for two or three months? Yeah. Do you think you'd find it difficult to get another job? No, not particularly. Then quit your job. So she did. Now, there's about a, there was about a two-week period, I think, between the time that she gave them, gave them her notice and when she would actually quit. And so she went back to work during that two-week notice period, and it was even more overwhelming, which is understandable, because now she knows there's solu a solution. Now she knows there's at least some relief coming, and so the usual job becomes even more overwhelming. So she calls me and says, I, I've gone completely backward. No, you haven't. You're just overwhelmed by more than you can do. It's just information. So imagine that. Imagine that you work out, and so you practice for weeks, and now you can lift 40 pounds over your head. Then one day, while it's over, so it's demonstrated that you can lift 40 pounds. You went from 10 pounds to 40 pounds. And then one day, while it's over your head, somebody adds 60 pounds to the bar. What would happen? You would drop the bar, hopefully not crack your head in the process, but you would drop the bar. Is it now true that you've gone backward? Oh, no. Is it true that you can no longer lift 40 pounds? No. Wrong. You still can. So you haven't lost strength. You didn't go backward. You still have the strength you had. You just discovered that 100 pounds is too much. That's it. That's all. And that's the case with a lot of us. We, we make progress to 
40 pounds, 40 units, I don't care, uh, in the ability to be unconditionally loving. And then along comes mm, a tsunami and overwhelms us. And we go, oh, well, now I don't know anything. No, nah, that's not true. No, it, it was just too much for you. Just information. So you wouldn't voluntarily take on 100 pounds. But sometimes a 100-pound load simply comes along and dumps itself on your head. Just don't choose it. <clears throat> I got an email. Uh, actually, I get a fair number of emails. Uh, and this person said, I just woke with the desire to post this on Facebook. The conditional nature of love I had as a child. So she was sending this to me kind of like, what did I think before she posted it? The conditional nature of love I had as a child was obvious. I was always loved conditionally. It's actually sure. kind of inappropriate to call it love. Uh, I was conditionally and briefly and superficially accepted would be a better way to say it. It's really regrettable that I, even, and I blame myself too, that I even used the term conditional love because it's not. Um, it ain't love. But it was easier to say that to compare it to unconditional love. So I was conditionally loved all my life. Then I found real love, and I had no difficulty accepting that I had never been loved before. Well, cool, because many people have to be beaten about the head and shoulders to get that. You continue. No blaming. Uh, it was just obviously so. And the overwhelming not enough feeling that I'd had all my life finally made sense. Do you hear this? All of you who are listening. This woman, uh, you wouldn't know this from what she said so far, is highly successful in everything she does. Everything she touches, she succeeds at. Unless it has anything to do with emotions. But because it never produced love or happiness, it all felt worthless. She felt worthless. In her words, not enough. That feeling's pursued her all of her life. She continues. But in turning away from all that toward unconditional love, I carried with me a number of misconceptions that have not served me well. Gee, don't we all? That trying hard would work as it always had before. Wrong. That I could earn real love and a sense of worth more old habit, wrong, that love would look as I had always idealized that it would someday and that it would be perfect, wrong and wrong, pretty lethal flaws, setting others and myself up for certain failure and making it pretty impossible to really live real love. This is really very well said. Um, she took her notions of love from the past and tried to apply them in a com on a completely new planet of unconditional love. So in the past, she had always tried to earn conditional love. Well, that works in the world of conditional love. In that crazy, unfulfilling, unhappy world, that, if you can call it, works. It, it helps you survive. You don't work to earn real love. You can't. She said, trying hard. Oh, man, this woman can work two people into the ground. Kill them. Mm, trying harder doesn't work in real love. Trusting does, but trying harder doesn't. Um, idealizing what it would look like. In other words, controlling what it looks like. Mm, that works in the world of conditional love, and it doesn't work in the real love world. Pretty smart to realize all this, although not necessarily easy to get rid of the misconceptions. She continues, as a bit of an achiever, <laughs> she's being very modest, who has earned her sense of worth in the world, this recent part of my journey has been pretty tough. Um, I've written about my ups and downs to be seen and loved, yes, but also to feel better about myself and to feel worthy. Again, flaws in my approach. So I'm stepping back again immersing myself in love and see if I emerge down the line with sounder foundations. I couldn't help but appreciate the metaphysical to immerse and emerge. That was really nice language. Um, 
But more important, you said, we'll see if I emerge with sounder foundations. Mm, wrong, because it sounds so uncertain, when the truth is that it's not uncertain. If you immerse yourself in this, but with a guide so that you're not self-evaluating, you will have sounder foundations. So notice what I just said. A, you have to immerse yourself in it. And B, you can't do this alone. Because what happens is we evaluate how we're doing according to the old ways. Impossible. I can't evaluate how I'm doing playing basketball according to the skills I had as a long distance swimmer. It's a new world. Um, she continues, truly feeling and trusting the love that I have and able to be loving to. Uh, I have children that I am desperate to be able to love better, but I have to learn to trust love myself first. Perfect. Notice she didn't say, I have to learn to love myself first. No, I have to learn to trust love given to me first. Nice post. Recently, I did uh, an intervention with a whole family. Um, two miserable and emotionally starved people, miserable and alone, just no clue. Then they got married. How do you think that turned out? It was awful. It was awful for them. And very soon after they married, they had a child. And very soon after they had the child, they divorced. And then for 12 years, no kidding, they spent more time involved in a court case than not. No joke. Alimony, child support, custody, visitations, who pays for the dentist, which dentist, which fillings will I pay for and which will you pay for? I wish I were making this up. It, it's a nightmare. The child began to, surprisingly, uh, act out, um, punching holes in walls. I first saw him and his mother at age 13. Um, the mother invited the father, remember they're not married anymore. Uh, father said, not a chance in this world. Uh, and when I saw the mother, she made a remarkable decision, um, more thoroughly than most people ever will. She decided to trust. <laughs> what a notion. And trust all the way. So she felt all the love that I gave her. And then, holy smokes, she loved her son. She'd never had it before. She didn't know what it looked like. Her son was dying of thirst in the desert and is screaming at her, Mommy, please give me water. And she's giving him, take your pick, cotton candy. Cotton candy tastes great, but it ain't water. Um, green vegetables. Mm, green vegetables are very nourishing, and they ain't water. So he was dying, but she began to love her son. And it was just the coolest thing to watch from a distance. I mean, she lived a long ways from here. Initially, he fought it. Of course he fought it. He didn't know what she was doing. In fact, he preferred to be with his father, who at least could be bribed, threatened, who would trade with him. In fact, it was so confusing to him that, that one night, I remember, um, he stomped out of the house with his mother, or from his mother, who was loving him, and stood in the rain, uh, bawling, and called his dad and asked him to come pick him up because his mother was being horrible to him. She was loving him, <laughs> but he didn't know what to do with it. So he's screaming for water. That, But see, that was in the beginning. Then she started giving him cotton candy and Brussels sprouts. And so he learned to scream for cotton candy and Brussels sprouts. Following this, this is really, I'm really kind of digging on this metaphor. And so he started screaming for the wrong thing. So she kept giving it to him. So when she finally learned to give him water, he's still screaming, expecting cotton candy and Brussels sprouts. And he didn't know what to do. But then the son began to trust the mom. And man, they, she's sending me stories of snuggling and talk. Hang on a second. Did you write down water, cotton candy, and Brussels sprouts? Have 
I'm having fun with that. Um, she's telling me stories of them snuggling and talking and watching movies together under the same blanket and loving. And it, it was just a miracle. He saw the contrast then between that, what his mother was giving him, and his relationship with his father. You ever want to highlight the futility of imitation love, expose somebody to the real thing. And then suddenly they can see it. They could never have seen it before. The father, as he had been his whole life, was empty and afraid and angry and continued to yell at the kid, buy his affection, argue, that kind of thing. But see, now the kid can't be fooled. He knows what water is now. And cotton candy isn't good enough. Cotton candy and rides on the Ferris wheel. And so one day, about a year after the initial intervention, when the kid was 14 uh, and his father's yelling at him, he stops, he looks his dad in the eye and he says, I have chosen not to spend any more time with you until you go to Georgia. <laughs> Whoa, the father blew up. Real guts on the kid's part. Father said he was being blackmailed, said the son was being brainwashed in a cult, um, went on and on. The son did not waver. He said, okay, it's a cult and I'm brainwashed and I'm not going to talk to you till you go to Georgia. <laughs> and so he came, the father did, along with the son and the mother. The father arrived skeptical, afraid judgmental, but he was astonishingly open. He had seen, you see, the effect of love on his ex-wife and on his son, and he felt the love, and he just folded. He gave up fighting to accept what he'd always wanted, love from anybody, which he'd never gotten. I held him. He loved it. He held his son. Oh, boy, that is the coolest thing to see. Because I had held his son a year before. I didn't even need to this time. His dad held his son. Oh, man. That, that's, the, that's the kind of experience that is so sacred, so moving, that I can't watch it. I have to turn away. It's that cool. Within two days, not only, they had a court case scheduled for the next week. No more court cases, canceled. No more custody fights. No more disputes about time or money or nothing. All gone. I get texts now from all of them. We're having dinner together as a family, all of them. The mother writes, we were so stuck. It's kind of an understatement. And now people are asking us, what in the bleep? is going on. We're all going out to dinner as a family. We smile. There's no conflict. It's like going to heaven. I think back in my life to the times when I was in love, and this kind of love we have now is way better than that. Freedom from fear, love everywhere, no words to describe this, end quote. It works. If, if people trust, initially her, the mom, then the son, then the dad, and everybody has to do their own trusting. She couldn't do the trusting for her ex. She couldn't do the trusting for her son. The son couldn't do the trusting for the dad, and I couldn't do the trusting for any of them. But they all chose to. Poof. Two days, they went from hellish court battles for 12 years to nothing, no conflict. Oh, they'll still have their They'll have an argument here and there. They will. But after you've had water and you're thirsty, you actually prefer water to cotton candy. No kidding. Here's somebody who writes, Susie has, I don't remember the actual name of the coach now, has been my coach for a few months. We talked mostly on the phone and wrote emails and texts. I was afraid of texting with her on Skype, but we've done it twice now. Both times I cried. I cried a lot. I shared about this uh, at a real love meeting. And again, I cried a lot. When after the meeting, a wise woman hugged me 
I was physically shaking. I always have to pull myself together a bit so I can function normally again after that. I feel like I could have cried a whole lot more. Is it normal that it is painful to feel loved? You could probably cry for days when you feel enough of this. But you're assuming that your tears are an indication of pain. Maybe, sometimes. We'll talk about that. Feeling loved is never painful. Ever. So what is? Um, fear that it's not real. Fear that it is real, but will go away. Um, the realization that your entire life up to that point has been a deception. That can be painful, but the love isn't. Um, fear that we'll somehow screw it all up, but love ain't painful. You continue. Maybe I'm just at the beginning of my journey still. <laughs> yeah, at the very beginning. So now you just stick around and you'll experience feelings you never even imagined. You'll have feelings you couldn't describe if you were writing fiction. Couldn't. You say, I'm trying to understand what is happening. There were moments with Susie, the coach, where I felt very happy and couldn't smile wider. But if she said something kind and loving, I just fell apart and went back to crying. <clears throat> Darling, you have a need for love that is as big as the Grand Canyon. You itch for it. Your soul cries out for it. You've been wanting to feel tenderly, unconditionally loved from childhood, but nobody ever gave it to you. Unbearably painful. And because you were kind of used to it, you never really get used to unbearable pain, but because it's all you ever knew, you didn't even know to call it pain. You had nothing until now. You've waited a very long time for this. And now that it's here, now that you finally have real love available, that iceberg around your heart is melting. And all the pain of the past is beginning to pour out. Why? You never really had a way to express your pain before. Why bother? Nobody would listen. But now people can hear your pain. So poof, it comes out in your tears. That's natural and good. Good for you. We cry for a lot of reasons, lots of different reasons. I could go on for a long list, but in your case, you're releasing the pain of a lifetime. So love isn't painful. But love is making you feel safe enough to feel your pain instead of just covering it up. Two, you're feeling a sense of relief that finally you can be seen and loved. That can bring tears up. And you're feeling an ecstatic ray of hope that after all these years, maybe finally you've actually found love and happiness. I'm tickled for you, kid. Stick with your coach and keep doing whatever she suggests. Don't quit. It's really kind of the secret. People ask me this all the time. What's the difference between the people who find love and happiness and those that don't? Oh, let me think. Trust and don't give up. New, new writer. Recently, I chose to sacrifice a friendship that I treasure greatly with a man I love, my best friend, so that he can work on growing through real love. I promised him that I would give him the time he needed and wait patiently until he felt he was ready to contact me again. So apparently, you decided that you two being together, I don't know how you did it because you didn't describe it, but you decided that you two being together would be a distraction for his learning real love. That is very often the case, that two people really need to be apart, even when they're married. Apart sometimes means even living in the same house, but not speaking. So I'm a little amazed at your wisdom in recognizing this. You say, I'm discovering that my selfishness is far greater than my good intentions. Gee, that's pretty common. Because I reach out in attempts to contact him repeatedly. I have failed at keeping my promise despite my best intentions. 
I feel great pain and emptiness. I feel lost without the ability to talk to him every day about the things we used to share and the fulfilling discussions that we've, you know, always had. So I'm not judging your decision to stay away from him so that he can learn real love. You made that decision and I'll just assume that there were great reasons for it. But once you've made that decision and you can't keep the agreement, that's a problem. It's not intentional, but you are using this man that you claim to love and care about. You're using him for your own purposes. You're using him for companionship. Like you said, somebody to talk to. There are guys who hire prostitutes, so they have somebody to talk to. They use them. It doesn't matter if they have sex with them or not. You're using him so that you won't feel lonely. You are addicted to him. You're addicted to his companionship. Not good. What do, how do I know you're addicted? Because you can't quit. And yet you know that it's the thing you're supposed to do. You can't quit. That's an addiction. Poof. Done. End of discussion. You're also interfering with your stated goal of giving him the independence to learn real love. You both distract each other. And it might help you to remember that each time you go to make contact with him, you are hurting him. It's like the parent who, when they, when they hear that their kid is homesick at camp, so the parent drives up from wherever they are to give their child a hug so they won't feel homesick. Well, <laughs> the kid loves the hug. And now the kid's going to be more homesick. You got to withdraw from this addiction because it's hurting both of you. If you miss him so badly because of the conversations you know you always enjoyed with him, that means you're not having this kind of conversation with other people, especially in the real love community. You're not reaching out to people who could genuinely love you and help you heal so that you don't come from a place of pain and addiction. When I say addiction, <laughs> underneath that is always pain. So your wounds are causing you to be an addict. And instead of dealing with the wounds, you're just temporarily making the addiction feel better. You're settling for companionship, pleasure, entertainment. You deserve better. So does he. <clears throat> you say, I know in my head this is the right thing to do, but my heart is having a hard time cooperating. I try to occupy myself, engage in things to keep my mind busy, but I constantly wonder how he is, if he's happy, if things are going well for him. And no matter how fun anything I'm doing may be, my mind is constantly thinking this would be so much better if he were here. I'm sad and it makes me cling and I don't have the strength I need to allow him the time I promised with all my good intentions. I'm empty and afraid. Honey, make some friends in real love. Get the real thing. I mean, look at your own words. You say everything would be better if he was here. Well, clearly that's a lie. And you've got to see that it's a lie and remind yourself it's a lie. Because if everything were better if he were there, the two of you wouldn't be apart. This isn't hard. I don't even need to know anything about why you separated or what your relationship was like. You're apart because everything wasn't better. So you need to heal. He's not going to make that possible. So you connect with people in real love. They're everywhere. Um, they're on conference calls. They're on Facebook. But in your case, you're going to need more than that. Uh, you're going to need real contact with people. You're going to need to phone people and then spend time in person with unconditionally loving people. However you make that happen. But that's what you need. Mike, um, a man I know, divorced his wife, who is crazy selfish and absorbed in her own activities to the point of complete neglect of Mike and their two children. He, when I first talked to him, he anguished about how to talk to her and how to co-parent the girls and how to deal with her craziness. And uh, the calls were just filled with desperation. I told him that he, he's not a co-parent with her. You don't co-parent with an ex. You alternately parent. 
That's it. He has, I told him, you got to let mom do whatever she wants. And he protested, well, but, 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 as people often do, but she's often mean to the kids who are young at, I think, six and eight, something like that, five and seven, I don't remember. Um, and I said, well, good, good. I hope she gets meaner. Of course, he had a hard time understanding that. I hope she gets meaner. She's just expressing who she really is because then the kids will see even better what you're doing when you love them. He wrote me just the other day. He said, the ex dropped the girls off today. And as soon as the, ah, well, there's the age, six-year-old walked in the door, she blurted out that her mother had gotten really angry and shouted at her until she cried. Then my ex and her mother forced her to do some activities that she didn't want to do with them. And it was a horrible time. So Susie, the little girl, uh, told me, I did what you said, daddy. Of course, this is what he and I had talked about. He taught it to her and she's now reporting back to him. She said, I did what you said. I remembered what you said to do if anybody is unkind or unloving to me or if I'm scared. This is a six-year-old talking. All the rest of us adults might pay attention to this. She said, I said in my head, my daddy loves me. My daddy loves me. My daddy loves me. And it was okay. Whoa, that is so cool. That's trusting. That's doing what we talk about every week. Find the love, trust the love, remember the love. And this six-year-old kid did it. Uh, he continues, uh, although Susie wasn't particularly happy about what happened, um, she was happy about herself and not at all victim-y. I think she might be trusting daddy's love. What do you think? This is pretty cool. Um, you're giving this six-year-old kid an anchor in the storm, better, a port in a storm. It's invaluable. Now, in addition, you might gradually teach her what to say to her mother when her mother is berating her or angry at her or whatever. She can say, mom or mommy or whatever she called her, I don't like it when you're angry. And then, of course, you're going to tell the child, and mommy will probably get angrier when you do that. So what do you say? Exactly the same thing. And you help the kid practice it, role play it. Mom, I don't like it when you're angry. Over and over, I'm, I'm here to tell you, because I've done this with a few hundred kids, the X will wear out. Really, it gets embarrassing to stand over a child and vent anger when the child is calmly saying, I don't like it when you're angry at me. I mean, how do you keep arguing with a child who's obviously completely right when you're being an idiot? Um, as adults, being an idiot doesn't stop us. We s still persist. but we find it really difficult to keep going when an innocent child shows us how foolish we're being. So teach your daughter to be persistent. My daddy loves me. My daddy loves me. That's already worked. And then to say to mom, I don't like it when you're angry. And she can do that when she's ready. It may take a while. But what you're giving your daughter is, oh, you know, invaluable. Uh, it, it's a jewel that she'll carry with her for the rest of her life. So I suggest all of us adults uh, be as wise as this six-year-old. Find the love, trust the love, remember the love. We win. We'll see you in a week. Nice to be with you.